Perfect. Well, I think we're going to get going. Um, I'm assuming there are going to be a few pe people that trickle in uh, a little bit later, but we'll kind of get through some uh, some intros and that sort of thing. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, I believe this is Spare's sixth webinar in, in the past year, uh, and the topic of today is managing change, how to optimize your paratransit with automated tech. Um, I'm personally extremely excited about this topic because I think it's one that's really on the top of everybody's mind right now. Um, ADA paratransit has existed for you know, some 30 years now without significant change and with emerging technology, we're now getting a taste of what the coming years will look like. Um, it's hosted by myself and my team at Spare, and we also have panelists from ADA Guru, First Transit, and Cheyenne Transit Program in Wyoming. Um, at Spare, we like to keep it uh, pretty short and sweet. So our goal is to spend about 30 minutes on the webinar portion and then have some time for the Q&A for the panelists at the end. Uh, I would love for you all to participate throughout the webinar too. Uh, you can submit questions through the Q&A function and you can also participate in the chat. And for the Q&A, we'll be able to address some of these questions in real time as we have some team members, Quinn and Nicola, uh, and they'll be able to respond to you right in there. And then of course, we're gonna have some time for questions for the, the panelists at the end. And, uh, and yeah, in the chat, I'd love to hear any anecdotes, uh, insights, or any sort of experiences that, that everyone has today in delivering automated paratransit. Uh, you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic still, and you know, we can all learn from each other today. So today we have got some amazing panelists um, who are gonna be sharing their experiences, especially as it relates to leveraging tech to improve paratransit systems. So uh, joining me today is Renee Jording, uh, Renee has been with Cheyenne Transit for more than 28 years, now the agency's director. Uh, she previously served as a dispatcher, operations assistant, and assistant director. Uh, Renee, can you say a, a quick hello? Hello. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and next we have Jess Segovia. Uh, Jess is the owner of a consulting firm called ADA Guru, where he assists transit agencies of all sizes to achieve ADA compliance using his philosophy of embracing the spirit of ADA. Uh, Jess, can you give us a wave? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, next, we got Tina Merck-Pierre. Tina is the Senior Director of Innovation and Technology Services at Mobility Operator First Transit, where she is in charge of driving strategic innovation and change management. So nice to have you here today, Tina. Thank you, thanks for having me. Uh, and last, we've got, um, Josh Spepsi. Josh is Spare's leading customer advocate and an implementation specialist in the tech sector. Josh has been launching many ADA paratransit and microtransit services with Spare over the past year. Hello, Josh. Hey, everybody. And, uh, and my name is Luke. Um, I'm the growth lead at Spare, and I'm looking forward to moderating today's session. Uh, thanks you. Thank you so much for everybody for being here today. So uh, I think we'll, we'll probably just jump right in. And uh, Jess, I am going to start with you to kick things off. As a paratransit consultant, you see many paratransit systems across the United States. Um, how would you describe the state of paratransit and what changes have you seen taking place? You know, what changes have uh, technology innovations led to um, from, from your perspective? Absolutely. Well, appreciate the question and participating today. Um, you know, I think it depends on where you fall. I see two groups within the paratransit industry. One group are those that are still sort of doing it the old fashioned way and have not embraced technology in large part. And so they're starting to feel a little bit behind. And then there's the other group. These are the agencies that have invested, you know, significant uh, uh, finances in order to uh, add technology to their operation. And so I think they see a really bright, exciting future because they're already on that road. And, and so, you know, whether it's fixed route or, or paratransit, you know, the testing of autonomous vehicles and, you know, that's kind of exciting. This significant move towards um, electric vehicles and, and, I mean, agencies just seem to be all in on that without a whole lot of hesitation. And then I'm starting to see in the work that I do, a lot of commitment to increasing customer service. And so what comes with that is the need to educate and continually 
uh, train and retrain staff. And so that not only do they know and understand ADA regulations, for example, and how to uh, comply and to meet the needs of riders with disabilities, but, but for this information to be introduced to them or reintroduced by way of retraining using some interesting technology. And so with COVID, a lot of my work has moved to uh, the virtual training environment. And so I, I see that continuing into the foreseeable future. Thanks, Jess. And you know, now for you, Renee, I think maybe you kind of fell into that, that bucket previously of feeling a, a bit behind. And as a paratransit operator who went from a very classical uh, delivery model to now an on-demand and more automated model enabled by Spare, I guess, what were you hoping to achieve? Uh, you know, what were some of the pain points you experienced that you were hoping to alleviate? Um, the first pain point um, was our dispatch. Because of COVID, we quit operating our routes and moved all of our service to on-demand service or paratransit service. And dispatch became overwhelmed. Um, if you're not charging a fare, obviously more people are going to use the system, which is what we want. But dispatch was constantly on the phone. I mean, there was no time for them to even breathe in between telephone calls. And the second part to that was scheduling was very difficult. So not only were they a lot of phone calls coming in, but the telephone calls were very long. It was, they were on the phone for longer periods of time than I wanted. So um, that was pain point number two. And then Scheduling, as I said, was difficult. I needed to make it so that anybody could schedule so that we could help them out as much as we could. And then the third piece was increasing efficiencies. There was a lot of rides that were not being provided because they were not grouped together. They were not efficient. And so that was the third thing I was looking for was how do I make all of those things happen quickly? Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like you kind of had kind of two issues that you're solving. One was for the rider experience and one was actually more on the sort of the staff side of things too. So I guess, yeah, can you talk a little bit more about sort of the, some of the issues around kind of staff and, and sort of, yeah, where, where that came from? I actually had dispatchers threatening to quit because they didn't have time to step away from the phone. They didn't even have time to breathe be, mm -hmm. between phone calls. And the, the time that they were actually spending on the telephone with each person to um, make the reservations was, was extremely difficult. So they were getting overwhelmed. They were becoming grouchy. And I had to do something to keep them here because they're all valuable employees. They have great knowledge and they know how transit works and they know our people. So I had to find a way, as I said, very quickly to solve those issues. Yeah, and Jess, I guess uh, maybe, uh, you know, I assume you've kind of heard some of these same challenges that, that Renee has kind of talked about here. Um, is that kind of the case? Absolutely. Um, I, a couple of weeks ago, led a series of trainings for a large ADA paratransit contractor and the drivers were actually commenting on there's enough stress in the job already. There are people with disabilities. It's a large vehicle, safety, safety, safety. And then there is the inefficiency in routing. And some of them were sharing how they were being dispatched three trips, all with the same pickup time. And they knew they could only get to one of them within the pickup window. And it adds this stress. So it's really employees of all levels, including our drivers who could significant, significantly benefit from some types of improvements and enhancements and technology can definitely be that. Hmm. Very cool, Thank you. thanks Jess. Um, and now I'd love to turn our attention maybe a little bit more from sort of the current state to focus a little bit more on sort of technology and solution side. And uh, I think no better place than to start with Tina. Um, Tina, what role does technology and innovation play in improving a transit system and particularly around paratransit service? Well, let's talk about technology first. So I see there's pretty much four major roles um, to improving paratransit services when it comes to technology. Um, it helps to improve communication. So operators are finding areas and where there are problems with riders reporting the issues. You've heard from Jess and you've actually heard from Renee about this, of not having a means, one thing, to locate where their vehicles are. Uh, are they in route? That's a big challenge. Also trying to get through to dispatch. 
You've heard this from Renee again, and what's happening in her environment can also be in hassle when the rider could simply use technology as a means of locating their vehicle. Now, technology delivers operational efficiency, which is important. We already understand how much the cost is to deliver paratransit in this traditional format, but looking at it from a perspective of on-demand really changes how the efficiency works and even the cost consideration. Now, the costs are reported as being as much as three to four times as fixed route, and all of us know this, and this has been happening for many years, but why not try the utilization of technology to improve and drive down these costs? And that's what we're seeing in the paratransit on-demand availability with that technology. The, the third thing I wanna focus on is that the technology can increase the rider engagement. Through its delivery, agencies will hear from their customers more often, whether it's good or bad, by the way, but they will hear from it. They will understand the issues that they're experiencing and hopes to be able to resolve the problem. Communication and engagement is important because how else an agency is going to understand how they're performing and what they need to modify their services. And lastly, with technology, it helps you to make a decision. It allows you to look at those data points to evaluate how to make improvements as well as allow the information to be quickly disseminated in the fashion that the rider prefers to see. Now, when I mean riders prefer to see, who says that paratransit riders don't use an app? They use it every day. You know, whether they are visually impaired or have other disabilities, they are using it. And besides that, you can also deliver information to them through an SMS text messaging about their trip and their trip status, even the jitterbug device. And that's a device that I have purchased for my grandfather. It can receive text messages so they can stay abreast of what's going on. Also, paratransit riders can hear updates through the IVR system. That's an interactive voice system on status. They can look at website and of course they can actually call dispatch. But one thing and one role about innovation, innovation is to finding a solution to the problem and trying it. Mm -hmm. This is really key. And this is what's going to really keep transit relevant in the first place by innovating. Transit needs to be able to adapt to all of these new realities of our you know, requirements of on demand. Choice selection is important. But then, of course, transit has the social responsibility, especially to an aging population, to help meet the rider's needs by creating a more frictionless travel. Inventing something new is not all technical, by the way. Sometimes it's simply needing to improve a process, Renee, <laughs> Jess, whichever way it's uh, to be able to do it. But those are the main culprits most of the time is the process and that's what needs to be focused on first. Thanks so much, Tina. Yeah, it really sounds like we got to, to rethink a lot of sort of the ex existing processes um, that have been in place for, for a long time to, to kind of get to a, a new place in paratransit. Um, and maybe Renee, if you could kind of follow up on this, obviously, your team, uh, you know, yourself and your team has really embraced um, innovation and technology uh, over the last year and uh, really kind of wanted to ask you, you know, have your pain points been alleviated by switching to spare? Uh, and obviously want you to speak, you know, candidly about this. Uh, yes, they were. Um, how the amount of time that the dispatchers have to spend on the phone with each caller has dramatically increased, or I mean, excuse me, decreased. Um, scheduling is much easier. The spare software system is very user friendly. Even I can schedule. Um, ride grouping has increased significantly as well which um, allows us to provide more service than we were before. So those rides that were unscheduled or, or people who were getting missed on, on calls are actually getting service now. So that's impressive for us. So yes, they were all met. Very cool. Uh, love to hear that. And yeah, thanks for the, the kind words. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll go over to you, Josh, where would love to kind of talk a little bit more about sort of the, the technical things on the, about Cheyenne. So Obviously, Renee and her team have been incredibly impressive. Um, they took a bold step to have a, a commingled paratransit and microtransit service as well, which is essentially 
you know, they're able to serve ADA compliant paratransit trips as well as microtransit trips with one fleet of vehicles, uh, but still very different service parameters with each. Um, you know, we know that change management is really critical for transit agencies uh, as their decisions directly impact people's lives. So uh, the question is sort of how do you and the partner success team at Spare ensure a successful transition and launch of new services? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, and I think Renee is a great example and the team in Cheyenne um, because they got up and running pretty quickly. <clears throat> even with a very complicated service. And, and, you know, while spare, I mean, technically we could get up and running in a few hours if we needed to. Uh, we generally like to leave three to four weeks of um, planning, building, testing, and then most importantly, training uh, to make sure that all of that happens smoothly. Uh, and, you know, each one of those sections is really important. And we talk about you know, really making sure we understand what the needs are, uh, mapping those across, uh, and then adapting them where necessary as well. We talked about innovation, so you know, making sure that any sort of older systems that we want to get rid of, we can we can move into the new system. And, and Renee mentioned that her dispatches are much happier now, which I'm glad to hear. Uh, and that's a great example of where we found you know new efficiencies and new processes. Uh, we're able to map those across into spare and 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 uh, make for an, uh, an efficient and an effective launch there. Thanks, Josh. And what would you say is sort of uh, maybe the biggest like challenge that you face when you're implementing these types of services? Is it like training, the, you know, getting people used to a, a new type of system? What would be kind of the, the main thing you'd say? Yeah, we have, uh, as a, as, you know, there's a number of things we run into. And I actually asked Renee this question yesterday when we were discussing this in advance, but um, it, it's pretty common across the team. So there's a little bit of a learning curve when getting up on spare. Uh, it's really, you know, robust tool. Uh, it's fairly easy to use, but there's a lot of little bits and pieces to sort of work on. So that takes some work, especially for the admin team like Renee. Uh, and then the other one and sort of the biggest one is driver training. You know, the drivers are the folks that are on the ground every day, um, picking people up, dropping them off. They really need to understand how the system works um, because, you know, they're the ones interacting it with it for you know eight hours or more a day uh, and then the last one and one that i think we we need to focus on even more is communicating to riders you know hey this is the change that's happening this is how you can interact with the tool um this is how you can call you know uh, you'll get notifications the app all that stuff is something that we we really need to focus on as well we do but it's something we can definitely improve too mm -hmm. so it's sort of the the marketing around it too to make sure that the riders are actually aware of the new system that you're putting in place and the the technology that they can take advantage of for sure. It has a huge impact in rider experience and on ridership. Yeah, now, now Tina, you've been involved in many different transit uh, innovation projects uh, with transit agencies such as DART in Dallas. Now you're with First Transit on the operations and mobility side of things. What are the best practices for transit agencies to manage the change and sort of bear this, uh, this leap of faith into, uh, into new tech and innovation? Okay, well, that is definitely a mouthful there. Um, it, it really depends on the organization and how open they are to innovate. You know, is your organization super conservative? Or are they gun ho for change? You're going to need an executive sponsor to spread and influence the new direction in an organization. So if you're going to get set up, that's the first thing you're going to need is an executive sponsor. Also, your organization must understand the only way that they can get innovative is when they give up on the traditional way of envisioning services, their technology, procuring opportunities and delivering results. Now, innovation doesn't have to be expensive. It can be actually focused on customer service improvements and automating internal processes. And these are kind of the things that, as Renee spoke about, it sounds like that this is what has been done with implementing of SPARE's platform. The other thing is, if you are the individual, and many of you are the individual that are gonna be tasked with driving such types of changes in your organization, you're gonna to have to be responsible for educating and defining what innovation means in that organization. Uh, understand not everybody understands the definition. This is what I found. And so it's very clear for you to be able to explain how to get to the next step. Because I'll tell you, typically it takes about 21 days to train a mind and train them differently. And you're going to need this as you look forward to making an expansion in your organization. Also, you're going to need to have an environment to be creative in. You know, look at doing internal internal workshops. They're always great. It creates an environment for open dialogue to help you to solve and resolve some critical issues that you may be having. 
it's also important to invite the staff from various departments to be able to speak freely, give their opinion and contribute to the findings and solutions. Things that Justice uh, just had said, he had mentioned about operators. Those are the people that touch the business and it's important for them to be involved so we can clearly hear what's actually happening out there in the street and with the riders. The other thing with this innovation is you must know the disruptors. You must stay abreast to those, but not only know them, what are you going to do about it? And then lastly, you have to test. Now, testing is going to be risky and you can and will fail. I'm not going to lie to you about this, but the biggest risk if you don't try at all to innovate. Even the best processes that have been developed five years ago are now antiquated and will need to be changed to sustain your riders. So it's time to find a means and a way of how to future forward your organization. Thanks, Tina. And, and I guess when you talk about sort of taking these risks um, or trying this out, uh, what could that look like? I know you're a fan of sort of pilots. Is that one way to be able to sort of alleviate these risks um, from for a transit agency? Yes. Absolutely. I, I truly believe in pilots. I truly believe in uh, proof of concepts that are out there because it allow you to test the waters before you turn the lights on and determine if this is going to be a permanent part of your platform or your offering to the customers. Mm. I, I can't express that enough. You know, when I mean testing and doing a pilot, I mean completely doing an end to end stage it, have your employees stay at home why they're testing the app to get picked up. What you're mm -hmm. going to find is educating yourselves on how the operator performs, also how the software and the application performs, are the configurations correct? Do you need to modify or make the changes? In addition to that is also could be your vehicles. The vehicles that you operated may have had a problem. You know, uh, one deployment we did at an agency and doing a testing, it actually failed, not because of the application, it failed because the air conditioning system in most of those vehicles needed to be fixed. And we're in the state of Texas and it was the summertime period. So the point is, it's important to do those types of tests to make sure that your rider's experience is gonna be what you have hoped for. Thanks, Tina. Yeah, now Renee, since making the, the switch over to Spare, what were some of the outcomes? You know, have you experienced the efficiency gains that you were, were really hoping for? Yes. Um, I, I want to share some numbers with you because I think that, you know, looking at the graph here does show you a lot of information, but hearing the numbers, numbers don't lie. And so I think it's important to share them. Our old telephone system or the with our old service provider, the dispatchers were actually spending four and a half, four point five five minutes on the phone with each rider, and that was the amount of time that they were talking to them, and the amount of time that they had to be on hold while they were looking for a place to put them. And with spare, the the time that they're actually on the phone now is two minutes and forty seconds. So that decreased quite a bit, which means now we have more time to take more calls. Um, dispatching is so much easier now with the spare service that, as I said, I can even dispatch. We're pulling in drivers um, to help in the dispatch area. And also our, our front office person is actually scheduling now from, from her chair up front because the system is, is that easy to use. It's, it's amazing. Um, and I'll just share our ridership. I'll share the ridership numbers from when I first started using spare. So the first week of spare, our completed boardings was 905 and that was in a one week period. The average boardings per vehicle hour was 1.72 and our pool trips was at 20.77%. Last week, our numbers were completed boardings, 1,334 boardings. Okay. Um, average boardings per vehicle hour went up to 2.69 and our pool trips went up to 42.8. So yes, we did meet all of my pain points are completely unpainful now. Very cool. And, uh, you know, I guess you have, you did make this leap of faith um, as, a, as a transit agency to something that was sort of brand new. 
Um, you know, what would you say to other transit agencies out there right now who are, you know, maybe hesitant, maybe they've started assessing this, they're in an education phase, like, you know, uh, you know, what would you kind of say to them today? Um, I, as you said, we, we took a leap of faith and I would say do it. Hmm. Tina mentioned pilots and I, I agree with her 100% that you should do a pilot if it's possible because it does teach you a lot. I mean, we're in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and what works in other places doesn't work here. You know, it's just pilots are an absolute amazing thing. And if I would have had more time, I would have done that. But because I was at a point where I needed a solution as quickly as possible, I wasn't able to do that. So I had to just do my homework and take that leap of faith. And it was, it was, an amazing journey, but at the same time, it was an amazing outcome. So I would say do it. Thanks. And if I may add to Renee's point, I think that it's it's critical to understand what your organization is up against, but you have to select the right partner. That is the main piece of it. You know, I I wouldn't discourage you from doing a startup, but you really want to partner with someone in Renee's case that has the experience that has done this before and is actively engaged with many different types of agencies using that platform. That's what I would encourage if you're trying to do a quick leap of faith. Oh, yeah, thanks, Gina. That's uh, it's a great way to, to think about it. Um, and now over to you, Josh. Uh, you know, Cheyenne Transit is utilizing some very advanced service configurations. Can you, you know, run us through some of them and, and how they actually improve their efficiency? Yeah, uh, it's kind of an exciting thing to talk about. And again, I have to commend the team over there. They've done a really good job of, of you know, taking on some of these innovative new um, tools. But, um, you know, we have a couple things. So advanced configurations that, you know, they look like this stop-based um, service for microtransit, um, along with the door-to-door -door paratransit service. And um, the thing that I, I find that's sort of, you know, the most exciting to, to discuss is the commingling of those two services. And so, Luke, as you mentioned earlier, we were able to get um, the efficiency of, of having them all on the same um, fleet. It also allows us to launch microtransit. And when you already have a paratransit service, you already have paratransit vehicles. They often have extra space. And so you can launch microtransit with the same assets. Um, and as Renee mentioned, you know, efficiency has gone pretty, you know, up very significantly. It sounded like it was close to maybe not quite double, but a pretty significant increase in efficiency. And that's most, you know, more than likely uh, due to the commingling of those two services. We're allowed to, we're able to sort of put two different groups, uh, keep all their parameters as necessary. And, and as I'm sure Jess would mention, uh, we need to be compliant with ADA. Uh, and so we're able to keep that to be the case for um, the ADA service and then also provide the microtransit service. That's a really big one. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, and Josh, Jess, maybe kind of coming back to you and, and wrapping up some of the, the stuff that we have talked about today, um, you know, reflecting on sort of today's panel, what would you, you know, what's your outlook, I guess, on, on paratransit? And maybe what are the next steps for transit agencies to take to benefit from a more modern approach? Sure. Well, you know, I see technology playing a key role uh and impacting who and how we hire in the future mm. um, i'm seeing agencies hiring individuals that don't have any or a lot of public transit experience and so if we're moving into the future and embracing technology i think we're going to start seeing those without specific transit experience but with who are tech savvy and have the ability to troubleshoot right and who can handle issues related to customer service and so i definitely see that happening now and well into the future you know when i think about technology i worry about how we are going to standardize it we have all of these new players in our industry coming in i can't tell you how many meetings i've been in where you know a company has a great idea they're not yet in our industry but they have a great idea for these new projects and products and they're going to fix everything and and none of them have worked in our industry before and so you know i just try to think about how are we going to have so many more players different technology and we already have issues with compatibility of 
of systems and the sharing of data and all of these things. So I think that's definitely something that we need to consider, you know, open source formatting perhaps as some kind of industry standard so we don't hit these roadblocks in the future. And that could be a significant roadblock for an agency wanting to invest in technology and embrace it and evolve and whatever system they choose, it's a closed system and they that may not work, especially, I know there are those of you on the call that work in public transit, but you also have mobility management responsibilities. And so you're always worrying about how are we going to connect with the region next door? How are we going to participate in our state's efforts for statewide transportation, which is not specifically a public transit issue, but it is definitely a mobility management issue and that impacts the work that we do. And so um, I'm excited. I mean, I, I really see agencies, you know, I worked for an agency that created a department called the Office of Extraordinary Innovation. And, and I laughed when I heard about it because it sounded so silly compared to where we started in public transit, at least I know in my career 25 years ago, if some, we were doing the same thing the way it had always be, been done and there was no indication that that was going to be changing uh, at any point. And so I think it's definitely a new day with new blood coming into our industry. I work with so many young transit professionals now and they're passionate and they want to provide amazing customer service and they want to have work that is meaningful to them. It's just a completely different world. So I'm, I'm very excited about the future. Mm, thanks so much, Jess. And, and maybe kind of the similar question, I'll ask a little bit differently to over to you, Tina. Um, you know, what is paratransit going to look like in five years time, let's say? I hope it looks completely different. That is seamless, just like fixed route. So an individual that is paratransit doesn't necessarily have to have a paratransit vehicle. They're able to not only connect through maybe microtransit or on demand or fixed route services, but they're able to use what AARP usually says, a universal means of delivering mobility to them. All seamless, no problems, mm -hmm. just like everyone else. Yeah, very cool. Well, I think that was a, a great way to conclude. Um, this brings us to our uh, question and answer period. Um, again, we'll be able to, uh, to get to some of the responses today. And, uh, and if we don't get to yours, um, we'll, we'll have a time at the end where we can provide some, some emails so that you can, uh, you can send some things as, as, in as well. Uh, we do have a couple questions coming in. Uh, feel free to add them now and we'll try to address as, as many as we can um, in the next kind of few minutes. So um, let me just dig into the questions here. Just give me one second. Um, so maybe this one would start with uh, Renee and maybe Josh, you could jump in too, but is it possible to commingle same day microtransit, same day paratransit and scheduled paratransit? Yes, I am doing all of those things. We, we allow our ADA people to schedule their trips two days in advance, but we also have standing orders. So our dialysis people are automatically scheduled every week. They don't have to call us. Um, and then we same day do ADA paratransit and we do general public transportation as well, all with one service and one one group of vehicles. Hmm. Very cool. I just wanna quickly jump in there uh, and just say that I think that's our, that's the best way to do it. Uh, in our experience, we find a lot of efficiency gains and we have all the different options. Um, people are scheduling, they need to fit in. And then those sort of on-demand trips can fill in, fill in the gaps as the as the day goes on. And another question for you here, Renee. Um, this is from David. Um, he's asking, um, how does the current induced demand post implementation compare to pre-COVID ridership? Um, so, what portion of paratransit customers are still booking in advance through the call center? Um. You know, that's a good question. I haven't looked at the numbers, but I, I will say that the majority of our ridership is general public, but um, I know that the majority of our standing orders are still there. So I, I can't give you a, a exact percentage because I don't know, but off the top of my head, I would say it's probably about 60% of them are still riding. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's good to know. And it sounds like, yeah, you're still getting sort of a, a mix. So you're not just eliminating how people are, are kind of booking you. They can still book in advance by phone if needed, but you're able to add these different types of booking methods um, same day or, or even by using sort of an app. 
Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, another one for you, Renee. Uh, did you get any resistance from the riders with this change? I did not. Um, we, we had a few, I'm going to say maybe three people, honestly, it was that low that because we had shut our route service down prior to um, partnering with Spare, it, it wasn't, they actually liked it because before it was so difficult for them to get a, a scheduled ride with our service the way it was. So switching over to Spare, it's so much easier now. They use an app, which again, we didn't have before. They can make their own reservations using the app. They can track the vehicle. They get text messages that the bus is going to be there within an hour and when the bus is arriving. So the majority of our uh, ridership is, they love it. In fact, I just got an email two days ago that said, if we go back to the old system, they will be very unhappy. <laughs> and okay. may I just add from yeah. uh, another deployment, um, their ability to be free. So that freedom has been one of the biggest targets for those paratransit riders. They don't have to depend and wait. They can actually schedule and do it whenever they want to go grocery shopping, go out with their friends. I mean, these are exciting times for those riders and they're able to communicate and put feedback within that app to let you know what's going on and how their drive or the ride has, has taken place for the organization. Hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks, Tina. Um, Josh, I think this would probably be the best one for, for you to, to talk about. Uh, the question is, can you elaborate on how microtransit is mixed with paratransit? And they're saying paratransit requires door-to-door -door service. Are you providing the same level of service for microtransit passengers? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the answer is we can do either. Uh, in many of our, our deployments, we have the same level of service in both cases. But um, in Renee's case, uh, we decided to, to go for a little bit more efficiency and, and have a um, uh, stop to stop service for micro transit and so the way that works is you know say the say the bus is going in to pick a person up for uh, a medical appointment they go to their door and pick that person up and then they might stop uh, at a road just a little down the way to pick up somebody who's a micro transit rider and, and sort of continue there um, so the system's able to handle uh, either of those cases okay so just kind of in summary josh um obviously the paratransit still remains door to door and then yep. the micro transit, at least in Cheyenne, for the most part right now, that is a stop to stop service. So people are having to walk a little bit to, to kind of get to a, a virtual stop to, to get on the vehicle. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah. Maybe Renee, I would love for you to, to ask, answer this one if, if you can. But I guess any uh, resistance from maybe like caregivers or care managers um, or like family members, I'm not sure if, if that has, um, has come up within your system at all right now. No, um, the caregivers actually appreciate it more because the, the most people that's on the bus at one time is four that we found, even with the efficiencies that we've received. So they actually like it a lot better because as Tina mentioned, it gives them a little more freedom because they don't have to decide the day in advance or five days in advance to be able to make the reservation. They can go in an hour if they want, um, if the availability is there. So they actually, the majority of, of our caregivers and, and the agencies that we work with that work with developmentally disabled or the seniors, they actually like it better than um, the old system. Hmm. Nice. Um, and this one for, for you, Tina, uh, it's asking, what should my agency be looking for in a paratransit software? Well, that is a lot that you need to be looking for. No, but seriously. You need to make sure that as an agency that you have flexibility in the configuration. You know, does it have virtual stops? Are you able to do door to door? You know, are you able to have different zones in those areas? Can you identify those zones and, and make sure that uh, those configurations can be handled by your team? Sometimes the planning team are the individuals that are gonna maintain the system. You know, how is the communication, especially from the front end? Can it be customized? Can I put my brand on it? Because you know, brand is important, right? Does it flow evenly for a customer? Is there too many steps in that app process for your rider to take place? But more importantly, how robust is that backend system? Can you get the analytics and the reportings that you need? Can you have that provider run you some simulations? just in case you need to be able to change the zone. 
and highly of importance is, is it able to, for the driver's side, because don't forget about the operator, can they get to their destination? Do they understand how that app is going to work? And they would be the promoter of it. Those are just high level pieces just to look for. Now, all the technical stuff behind the scenes, it can be done, um, but it is key. But the last thing I'll say, since this is paratransit, what about that eligibility? Is mm. there any eligibility module to support? Because understanding your rider and having that information that can actually be pushed out from the back end will be important. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a really great point. And uh, and I know Jess, we Jess, we've spoken about this before, and just like the importance of the, you know, the eligibility um, portion of that. I know you deal with that a ton. Um, so can you speak for a minute just on like kind of the importance of of that, Jess? Of course. Well, you know eligibility specific to technology, I think there is so much opportunity. Mm. Uh, I have seen a number of systems that are able to manage the data, but I think what our industry is ready for, and I'd love to participate in the development of a system that will help make the determination based on the observations, the data entered, whatever information is provided by the doctor, by if we do in-person, et cetera. And so I definitely think there's a lot of opportunity to help because what I'm seeing, there, especially smaller agencies, there could, be, there could be a transit agency of one or two in a city and they have responsibility for everything, overseeing their contract for the delivery of service. And then they are the eligibility determination professional also. And so how do you become an expert in all of these things? It's very, very difficult. And I have people calling and asking for help or interpretation of regulations and these types of things all the time. And so uh, I, I do think that, that there is a great opportunity for technology to help in eligibility. And, you know, Luke, you, talked on, you touched on something earlier, like, you know, what is the future of paratransit or, or what decisions are we going to make? And when I began in paratransit, we insisted, we are not a social service. We are public transportation. We pick you up, we drop you off, and we tried to be as impersonal as absolutely possible. And the industry has gone in a completely different direction where now we are like a social service. A lot of communities do not have a very strict eligibility process because they don't want to exclude individuals who need transportation. And if they don't qualify for paratransit, there's nothing else for them. And so our industry has sort of embraced that role of acting in certain ways as a social service or a human service agency. But, you know, we can make choices to change that in small ways that might help with efficiency. The regulations, for example, do allow for an agency to provide what we call feeder service. Mm -hmm. So instead of taking someone from their origin to their destination, we take them to the nearest accessible bus stop or right or light rail station. And it's the same thing at their destination. And so there are a lot of things that the ADA allows us to do. And maybe because it's difficult, maybe because we don't have expertise within our agency collectively, it just looks like we haven't made these choices, but there are still so many choices that we can make. Uh, we just need to make sure if we do, for example, do a feeder service as a system design we're going to need to have some other services to help complement that. And a lot of agencies have created non-ADA dollar rides, and then they give the rider a choice. You can schedule same day for this non-ADA service or the day before for your ADA paratransit. We want them to choose the non-ADA version because there are mm -hmm. not as many strings attached. So there are decisions that are operations staff or, or collectively our executives make every day that could be changed in a very short period of time if we wanted to do that but there, there would need to be the collective and the community will for that yeah yeah absolutely um and maybe just kind of one more question here um maybe renee um i guess do you, what is the software's ability to track actually sorry just one question here um how are the commingled services affected by um, ADA regulation? Um, maybe Brene or Josh can can touch on on those things. Oh, Renee, do you want to go for it? 
Yeah, I will. Um, after checking with the powers that be, because we are providing the same service to everyone, um, there really are no ADA regulations that we have to follow, but we still choose to. We still give um, our ADA qualified people the opportunity to schedule two days in advance, and then the general public can schedule up to the day in advance or the same day. So, and, and our ADA people can obviously schedule, you know, same day as well, but um, because we, as I said, er, is, it's equal service and that's all we have to provide um, according to the ADA. And so we, we make sure we do that, but we still, like I said, go that one step further for our ADA qualified people. I, I think we've heard that a number of times um, through the webinar today is it's really about sort of the choice and still providing everybody the, the same choice, um, but also the choice to be able to, to leverage more technology um, when they want to, to move forward. So that's fantastic. Um, on that note, I'm going to wrap things up. Um, I guess for, for anybody in the audience listening today, if you do have another question, uh, please email one of us here. Uh, we have our, our contact information on the screen. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to the panelists in sharing their time and insights. Uh, clearly the experts in their field uh, with so much knowledge to share. And you know, I think the outlook of, of paratransit is very bright. And I'm looking forward to the amazing results that will come out of a future really enabled by automated tech. So. Uh, thank you everyone for attending today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Cheers.